Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. It's a tougher environment than I've ever seen. The state of journalism in an era of so-called fake news. What Bastion is doing uh, is really the, the other half of the equation that the, that the VA can't write a prescription for. Louisiana's one-of-a-kind neighborhood for returning war heroes. The problem I have with the book isn't so much about the book itself, but the way as a culture we embrace it. Critics review the book known as America's most loved novel. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, a look at some of the other stories making headlines across Louisiana. The state health department may have spent $85 million for people enrolled in Medicaid expansion who didn't qualify. The legislative auditor found problems for this 20-month period, saying the agency's use of wage data at application and renewal to determine eligibility was not sufficient. Health Secretary Dr. Rebecca Gee says the agency's brand new technology just put in place will increase accuracy moving forward. High-speed internet service is coming to more than 54,000 homes and businesses in rural North Louisiana. Areas that until now had slower service or in some cases no service. Public Service Commissioner Foster Campbell says it's thanks to $22 million in federal money that's part of the Connect America program. He says it's good news for people and business owners in my district. An environmental group may sue the federal government to protect two species of turtle found only in Louisiana and Mississippi. The lawsuit claims U.S. Wildlife and Fisheries did not take action to get the Pascagoula map and Pearl River map turtles on endangered lists. Governor John Bell Edwards was in California this week mixing it up with Kim Kardashian West, rapper Meek Mill, and other celebrities at a summit working to reshape criminal justice laws. Variety and Rolling Stone magazines sponsored the event. It put Edwards and some other governors on a panel with celebrity advocates for criminal justice reform, with a stronger focus on rehabilitation efforts. Southern is going with a new health care company to operate its medical marijuana program. State regulations allow only two state universities, LSU and Southern, to process the med marijuana. But while LSU's operations are underway, Southern's have been held up by problems with the first company it hired. The governor released a good news statement about Louisiana's economic growth after the Bureau of Economic Analysis announced the state GDP is outpacing the national average. Our rate of 4.3 percent is just ahead of the nation's 4.2. As a result, the state has the third fastest growing economy among 12 states in the southeast region, and that's ahead of Alabama and Georgia, and it ranks 12th nationally. A look now at the state of journalism in today's anti-media environment. The phrase fake news was unheard of until Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Today, we hear it everywhere. Does it impact news coverage? To learn more, I talked with nationally known investigative reporter Chris Drew. A year ago, he returned to his Louisiana roots when he joined the faculty of the LSU Manship School of Journalism. When Chris Drew hears the term fake news, like any legitimate journalist, he bristles. Drew's resume is the stuff of journalistic giants. 22 years at the New York Times, working in Washington and New York. Numerous honors, among them a George Polk Award. 
It has been described as one of only a couple of major journalism prizes that means anything. He also co-authored a New York Times bestseller. Upon his arrival at LSU, this tweet said it all. Hashtag new at LSU. A former investigative reporter and editor for the NY Times, Christopher Drew is inspiring his students to be passionate journalists. He's also encouraging them to be observers of the times we live in and researchers of times past. He says at some point there will be much to learn from the state of journalism today in this climate of anti-media. It's a tougher environment than I've ever seen. You know, I went to Washington originally in, in the mid-80s and I did a lot of reporting there through 2017 from the Reagan administration into the Trump administration, the start of it. And I've never seen any other politician try to demonize the media uh, the way Trump does. But it's no different than really what he does, uh, you know, with the European allies or, you know, with other institutions in the country or this past week with the Broward County election supervisor. You know, whenever there's a controversy and he's got a stake in it, you know, part of his attack mentality is to try to delegitimize whoever might criticize him. So I think the press sees the pattern and it's hard to deal with, it's hard to take, it's, it's hard to take personally when you're trying to report, but you realize it's not just you too, it's part of this bigger pattern. As he covered the biggest of national stories, it meant he was front and center reporting on the White House, which began during the Reagan years. Most other presidents, you know, they used to have a saying you know, years ago, you don't uh, fight with, pick a fight with somebody who buys ink by the barrel. And whether it's print or digital, now, you know, the, the pen is mightier than the sword. The idea that, you know, people writing about you, you know, have access to, to readers and, and draw their conclusions and can influence public opinion. So it's very unusual for a politician to decide, I'm just going to go out and try to put the press on its heels as a, as a matter of a general tactic. Right, a full court pressure uh, uh, relentlessly. With your vast experience and all the years you've covered things, is there any president or leader that comes close to what you see in this day? The only one I can think of is Richard Nixon uh, during Watergate. You know, if you go back, there's plenty of sound bites of uh, Ron Ziegler, who was the White House spokesman, saying, you know, the Washington Post, we don't know where they're getting all these stories with these anonymous sources and Nixon and his aides denying that you know anything happened in Watergate. Uh, his first vice president, Spiro Agnew, uh, used to talk about, call the press the nattering, nattering nabobs of negativism. And uh, he, he kept calling the press that right until the day he got indicted for crimes he had committed as the Maryland governor and had to resign as vice president. And you know, Nixon denied any involvement in Watergate and criticized the Post, tried to ban the Washington Post from reporters from coming to the White House, right up until the day he suddenly announced his resignation. So is there something different, a different approach that journalists could use as they cover the situation moving forward? I think that's an interesting question, and it's one that is getting more debate, you know, in media circles. Uh, Jim Rutenberg, a New York Times media columnist, wrote a column the other day where he actually went and talked to political strategists and said, well, you're used to these kind of mano a mano fights and name calling in politics, so what should the press do? So some felt like, you know, maybe the press, you know, you spend your life as a reporter trying to find out what the best version of the truth you can, so it offends you when somebody routinely uh, says things that aren't true. As he instructs his students to delve into the civil rights movement, for example, he wants them to look at those few who stood up against their white neighbors to help the disenfranchised achieve a level of human decency. It may not have been popular in Mississippi in the 1960s, but look how it's viewed now. I try to make the point to them that sometimes amid all the sound and fury, you can't really see till later you know, who was right. And if there are certain bedrock principles, just about basic dignity and rights and whatnot, you still have to stand up for those, you know, and the truth as, as a reporter. 
I also wanted to hear from some other prominent Louisiana political and investigative reporters, especially in the wake of CNN's Jim Acosta being banned from covering the White House for asking the president questions. First, a big welcome to Elizabeth Crisp from the Advocate newspaper, Kieran Shawla, WAFB TV in Baton Rouge, and Greg Hilburn, USA Today Network newspapers. And a command performance. And a command performance <laughs> also, and Monroe News Star. And, you know, it's been interesting that we've looked at journalists this past week and sides that are always opposing, CNN, Fox News, for example, banded together over this lawsuit uh, that CNN lodged to get Jim Acosta back his press credentials, essentially to cover the White House. So that event has happened. Before we move on, I want to take a look, show you the clip, a small part of the clip of what happened at the White House as Jim Acosta was talking to the president. Let's take a look at that now. Well, way. That, that's I not an invasion. Should, honestly, uh, I think you should let me run the country. You run CNN. All right. And if you did it well, your ratings well, let me would be ask, much better. If I, if I may okay, ask one enough. other question, Mr. President, if I may, if I may uh, ask Peter, one other ahead. question, are you worried? Of, that's enough. That's Mr. enough. Mr. President, I, well, that's I was enough. going to ask one of the, the other folks. That's had, enough. Pardon me, ma'am. I'm, I'm, Mr. Excuse President, me. that's enough. Mr. President, I had one other Peter, question, if I may ask. I'm going to ask each of you to give a one word reaction to what you just saw. Elizabeth? Unfortunate. Karen? My immediate is wow. Hey, Greg. Combative. Combative. Okay. Anything like that ever happened to you all in anything you've covered? Have you ever gotten in a situation where it was heated? Um, perhaps you were not dragged out, but it was contentious. Probably not publicly. Certainly not as publicly as that whole situation was. Um, I think that it's, especially for a newspaper reporter, there are a lot of times where things get um, sometimes combative on the phone or behind the scenes. People wouldn't necessarily see it play out. What about you? I've had that situation, and it's one of those that as a reporter, before an investigative reporter goes in questions, you have your T's crossed and your I's dotted. You have your documentation in your hand. You have your proof in your hand. You're really going to get that interview to have that person comment or respond to it. So I've been in that situation, and the interview just kept arguing and arguing and arguing, and I had the facts that said otherwise. And it's one of those as a reporter will do you back down and just let your interview go ahead and lie. Or what do you do? And eventually you have to just shut down and let the viewers decide for themselves. Were you ever tossed out of anything like that or asked I've been to in, I've leave? been threatened to be arrested <laughs> 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 right. if I didn't leave property. I've also been accused of fake news. And I have to say my initial reaction was, excuse me? Greg? Uh, you know, like Elizabeth, we've, we've had some pretty fractious inter inter you know, exchanges with sources, but they're not on camera generally. Um, Elizabeth and I were sitting beside each other in the airport when uh, President Trump was here uh, up for a rally for Senator Kennedy. And he did, of course, point mm -hmm. to us, not us, because he doesn't know us, but specifically, <laughs> look back there, fake news. You know, people turn around and shake their finger at you. So the band of journalists. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah we're on the back row. Yeah. And Kieran, you were there also. Okay, well, so, um, so. It's, uh, yeah, and people just turned around and started right. screaming at yes. us. Right. It was it very was, weird. It was very <laughs> awkward. Was all, the entire audience just turned around. They were like <laughs> looking at you. Do you find it publicly that people use the phrase fake news perhaps against you? Have you heard that just out and about, even if you're not on a story? I have. Yeah. yeah. You have. Yes, I've been accused of it. I was in an interview and... We were, we had finished that main interview, but we were getting just some shots of all of us talking and the photographer was still rolling and I'm trying to tell him this is my paperwork, this is my proof. And he said, that's fake news. Do you think that um, in certain areas, the, the trust of the press, of the media has been eroded because of the constant barrage of hearing this term in tweets and day after day? I think that it's, it's actually getting to a point where it's going beyond the the term. The term has become so widespread that there are little ways to signal it. For example, um, it has happened multiple times that um, Senator John Kennedy has, in front of cameras, said, notice the advocate didn't write that down. 
it's been me and then another reporter who covers Livingston Parish. So called out. Yeah, but both times it has just been, notice the advocate didn't write that down. I, I don't write down anything that, you know, everything that anybody says. I think nationally the perception is that, that there's, that, that, you know, the respect for journalism is, has eroded. I don't find that the people, our readers or our viewers, uh, feel that way. I feel like we still have a trust among those yes. in this state or in our markets. And I think it would be like that in other states as well. But, you know, it, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's dangerous and that, that there could, you know, that perception could continue to trickle down and continue to erode the reputations of, uh, of journalism in general. And I'm just going to tell you something. I'm proud to be a journalist. And we are not the enemy of the people. If you want to, if you choose to trust whatever your government says and you don't want anybody watching, then that's fine. But there are journalists, not so much in America, but all over the world, being murdered and killed mm -hmm. by governments. Well, each of you have taken time out of your <laughs> schedules. You're covering things today. So thank you so much for taking part in this discussion because it's something that people are talking about. So thanks so much for being here. Thank thanks you. for having us. Major development here today. A judge ordered the White House to return the press pass of that CNN reporter, Jim Acosta. For veterans seeking a true sense of community, Louisiana is home to the nation's only neighborhood designed exclusively for returning warriors. Senior producer Kevin Gotro takes us to the development. It's located in Metro New Orleans. Bastion has helped me in the 13 months that I've been here more than any other organization that I've encountered since 2006 since I've been out. It's just an honor to be amongst these veterans that had really done so much for us. For the first 11 years uh, after exiting the military, uh, I haven't really been able to find a niche. And uh, I've pretty much just been trying to find a community that is suitable for me. And I've just found that uh, about a year ago when I came here to Bastion. Bastion uh, is America's first intentional community for returning warriors and families with life-altering injuries. It's designed from the ground up to support uh, individuals who may be facing challenges related to traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress. Sometimes with my post-traumatic stress, I become isolated. But the way that Bastion is built, the houses pretty much face each other. And so I have more of an opportunity to engage uh, with my neighbors and with other veterans. With Bastion having uh, weekly events um, at the Wellness Center, I'm able to be more social now. Uh, I feel comfortable uh, being in social settings. We were very intentional about diversifying the population. Uh, we wanted to bridge the military-civilian divide, so in addition to uh, warriors and older veterans who live at Bastion, we also have civilian households. My area, my porch, is the porch where everybody comes and sit. They don't call me Ann, they call me Miss Ann, because I'm old enough to be their mother and their grandmother and I love them. I love them like I do family. They are my family. We know that service can be a very powerful modality for reintegration and healing. This is something that military folks uh, understand. They're hardwired to serve. And so we look at service really as a continuation. Whether it's weed eating, cutting grass, raking leaves, uh, giving someone a ride to the store. It's a way for veterans to get outside of their shell and it allows them the opportunity to be integrated into the community.
sometimes veterans don't really like to go to the, the, the Veteran Affairs Mental Health Center. It kind of gives uh, a complex. So once a week, there's, a, there's a, a social worker from Veteran Affairs that comes to the Wellness Center and just holds small groups. What Bastion is doing uh, is really the, the other half of the equation that the, that the VA can't write a prescription for. We're talking about instrumental. ...between Wisconsin Public Television and the Kindling Group made possible with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. See more Louisiana videos under the Stories tab at veteranscominghome.org. We know that holistic medicine treats the whole patient. LSU's new holistic approach to admitting students uses the same philosophy of seeing the whole student. It means some applicants are considered, even if their ACT or grade point averages, fall below LSU standards. The holistic approach sees other factors like activities and student essays. This month, Louisiana Public Square explores the change by the state's flagship, the controversy created, and what college entrance standards should be. Here's a preview. Patrick Gagan is a finance major and columnist at the Reveille, LSU's student newspaper. He penned a column opposing holistic admissions, comparing it to the lowering of credit standards in the 70s and the resulting housing bubble. Many of the people receiving mortgages, um, you know, some didn't have jobs or incomes. And when you lower the admission standards and you give people without incomes uh, mortgages, you know, delinquency rates, they rise. He says a similar move by LSU will attract unprepared students and lower academic standards. I predict that grade inflation is, is, a, is a more likely outcome. Um, and grade inflation basically means that uh, professors kind of like water down the curriculum. There are a lot of people out there that think that we're uh, lowering the standards and we're not. It's, it's going to help the overall makeup of uh, the mix of, of uh, kids at the university. Ronnie Anderson is president of the Louisiana Farm Bureau and sits on the LSU Board of Supervisors. He says that a lack of resources in rural communities often prevents those students from meeting admission requirements. The changes to LSU standards will be monitored by the supervisors, Anderson says. If our uh, level of, of uh, achievement drops at LSU, we're going to adjust and look at that and, and make changes and, and do some things. We're not going to allow that to happen. The final work that we produce and the product that we produce is going to be no less using this approach than the other. That was LPB President Beth Courtney reporting. An Eye on Admissions airs next Wednesday at 7 p.m. on LPB. Visit lpb.org slash public square for more information. A discussion by a panel of distinguished authors was one of the focal points of this past weekend's 15th Louisiana Book Festival at the State Capitol in Baton Rouge. Their discussion centered on the Great American Reads selection of To Kill a Mockingbird as the most loved American novel. LPB joined hundreds of book lovers who poured into the State Capitol this past Saturday to celebrate the Louisiana Book Festival. But it was a vote that happened online by PBS viewers before the doors of the festival opened that grabbed so much attention. The vote of America's most loved novel. This group of nationally known authors debated the viewer's choice of the 1960 Harper Lee classic To Kill a Mockingbird. The book won the Pulitzer Prize and achieved immediate success, success that only increased when Hollywood put it on the silver screen. But for all its enduring acclaim, this seemingly simple story about the Depression-era South continues to stir controversy, and the panel gave its top selection a long critical review. It's interesting the degree to which the book continues to be controversial when it's taught today. You know, every year, I mean, just in the past two years, there have been times where various school districts have decided not to teach it or take it off a recommended reading list. And, all, and whenever that happens, there are always these outcries like, oh, how can you hate to kill a mockingbird? It's the most <laughs> terrible thing, to kill a mockingbird. It's the most, 
you know, innocent, lovable book there is out there. But it's complicated. The problem I have with the book isn't so much about the book itself, but the way, as a culture, we embrace it as a book about racism when there's so many really important books about racism that are from a more firsthand experience of it, right? It's so hard to judge, you know, uh, it's not just a book by its cover, right? It's a book by its place in society and what society has done with it. And I think it, it does speak volumes about where we're at that, that that's become the, the number one book. There's so many books that speak to that exact topic from so many different angles. And when we rely on the one that has the white savior narrative over and over again as like, this is the method. It's exactly that we teach kids, you know, that this is how to deal with racism. There is no debating that To Kill a Mockingbird, 58 years after it was written, still stirs passions. And that's our show for this week, everyone. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.